which is methodologies used in the two fields. So the aim in psycholinguistics or human speech processing is to understand how listeners recognize spoken words. So how do we process speech in the human brain? In automatic speech recognition, the aim is to build algorithms that are able to recognize words automatically under a variety of conditions with the least possible number of recognition errors. So those are two vastly different um, uh, aims. Now, when we look at a very, very simplified process of speech recognition with the blaze doesn't work, oh here, the, the speech signal on the left and then some kind of speech recognition box in the middle and then the recognized words on the right side, then within human speech processing, the focus typically is on the last bit. So of course we use um, the acoustic signal, but we're not so much interested in the acoustic signal itself. We're, we're basically looking at, can we figure out what's happening inside the brain on a specific aspect of the recognition process? For instance, how do we process words in background noise? What's the effect of listening in, an in another language? How do we acquire um, the first language? Those kind of questions. Within automatic speech recognition, we have to deal with the entire process from the acoustic signal to the recognized words, because otherwise you don't actually have automatic speech recognition. Another difference is that within automatic speech recognition, the algorithms that we use to do uh, the recognition are completely understood mathematically. On the other hand, within human speech processing, there are actually no unified theories of how we process speech. There are many separate theories that focus on parts of the entire recognition process, but none of them actually encompass every aspect. So how do people in the two fields carry out their research? So in human speech recogni recognition research, you typically have behavioral studies. You ask people, well you typically you put a person into a soundproof booth, you give them headphones, uh, you, you give them a screen, some sort of microphone, a, a button box, keyboard. You play them some sounds, words, uh, something with speech, and then you ask something. So you ask, for instance, is this a word or not? That would be a lexical decision task. What kind of sound do you hear? You give them two or three options. Eye tracking, you are playing sound to or speech to people and you're looking at where are they looking on a screen. Or you can carry out brain studies, uh, for instance, fMRI or uh, EEG. And there have been some papers, uh, papers here at the conference on EEG and speech processing. Or you can build computation models, which basically are implementations of the human speech recognition process in a computer model, trying to simulate what might be happening in the human brain. Now, all these different techniques will give you measurements, like reaction times, phony response mobilities, error ident or identification rates, eye movements, brain waves. And these measurements are used to infer theories on parts of the human speech recognition process. So as I said, not about the entire process, just about small chunks of it. And ideally, we're going to move towards this grand overarching theory. Now, in automatic speech recognition, Typically, people work on, for instance, improving the deep neural network architectures, improving robustness against adverse listening conditions, uh, like noisy backgrounds, improving language modeling, like in this session. Uh, mapping to other languages is, is a topic that's uh, close to my heart. So can we build a system that is trained on one language and map it to another language for which we have less, data, uh, less training data? The synthesis of voices or detection of paralinguistic information. So the type of Questions that are being asked in the two fields is quite different. The types of methodologies that people use is quite different. Now, how do humans then recognize speech? So what has been found? What is assumed that's happening in your brain while you're listening to me speaking here? I'm going to just present one slide on this. Um, because if you want to know more about this, there's a vast literature, and I just want to give you primers about what's happening, and if you want to know more, you can uh, look it up. But basically, the idea is you have an acoustic signal at the bottom, and as you're listening to the speech unfold over time, s sound categories are being activated. These sound categories 
are the sound categories that actually resemble what's in the speech signal. And not just the ones that have been produced, so if uh, Mary has been uh, produced, then it's not just the hmm that's being activated, but in fact, all sounds that resemble it are activated. And that unfolds over time as well. Now, this looks pretty neat, that's not reality. So what people have found is that actually the activation of these different sounds that are, that are present in the uh, speech signal, or are likely to be present in the speech signal, are activated at the same time and overlapping in time with one another. Now, all these sounds that are being activated, in turn, activate the words that they are part of. And not just the words that start at the, with, uh, at the, uh, the, uh, with the same sound as the one that you just heard, like here, uh, Mary, and Mary, and marinated, and Mare, etc., but also words that start later in time, like Aaron, and Rib, and Aristocrat, or words that even start earlier in time. So as you're listening to speech, all words that resemble a part of the acoustic signal are being activated. And the task of your recognition process in, the, in your head is then to eliminate those words that are actually not in the acoustic signal. Now, how does automatic speech recognition work? So I'm give only giving one slide on this as well. So this is the old standard way of doing things. You have an acoustic signal, you transform the acoustic signal using some acoustic pre-processing into vectors, and these vectors are being processed by a search algorithm that tries to map the vectors onto a series of recognized words. It uses acoustic models, which is basically a representation of a speech sound. It uses a lexicon, which basically says, how you should pronounce a certain word. And you have to realize that humans are able to recognize a word that they've never heard before. They can recognize whether a word is a word or a non-word. An ASR can't do that. So if a word is not in a lexicon, it, the ASR system cannot recognize it. That's a, that's a major difference between humans and machines. And they, it uses a language model, which basically gives you the probabilities of how often a word occurs or how often a sequence of words occur, uh, occurs. And these information sources together help you to create sequences of words, and hopefully the best one will be at the top. And those will be your, would be your recognized words. So as I said, this is sort of the standard way of doing things. Um, lately, there has been a new uh, approach, which is called, called listed attendance spell, where the need for these explicit information sources is actually no longer there, and that is being solved within um, within the model. So, if we then look at continuous speech recognition, so how do machines recognize speech, and how do humans recognize speech? You get a, a picture like this. So, in an ASR system, you have a begin node and an end node, and you have all kinds of paths through the search space. And basically, what you're doing is trying to compute, the, compute the, the, the cheapest path through this graph, and that's the one that you recognize. In human speech recognition, we don't actually have something, we don't think of speech recognition as a graph. We think of it as words that are being activated in the human brain while we're listening to speech, and these words compete with one another, which means that Words like spider and pie and spied, which overlap in sounds, all use the same chunk of the acoustic signal. The task of the human brain is to create a sequence of word that, take, that ba basically eats up or uses the entire acoustic signal and makes sense. So again, you would have your um, sequence of recognized words at the end. So the, well, no, I get that. So you might wonder, so you've only been talking about all these differences, right? So why would cross and interdisciplinary research be interesting? Especially given the differences in hardware, so brains versus computers. Well, I think it can be very interesting, but you have to look at it from a different perspective. So you should not be focusing on the fact that we are looking at different types of hardware, but we can use Mars three levels of an information processing system. So the brain and the computer are at the bottom here. It's called the implementation level, which basically uh, focuses on the physical realization of the representations and the algorithms. 
One level up is the algorithmic level, and that's how functions are performed. And this is kind of tiny in here, but these are the two different ways of how continuous speech is being recognized by, by an ESR system and a human. But the most important thing is that at the top level, the abstract computational level, the two systems have to do the exact same thing. The humans and machines necessarily compute the same functions as both must perform the same task, which is the recognition of the words in the speech signal. So despite all differences, what we want to do is actually the same thing. We want to recognize the speech. So that's one reason why I think looking across the borders and integrate uh, the two research fields is really, uh, is really interesting. Another one is, despite the fact that ASR systems have become quite good in recent years, human listeners are still the best recognition systems out there. So I'm giving, going to give you some comparisons of recognition performances. There's a seminal paper uh, by uh, Richard Lippmann, 1997, and what he did was he compared um, so he basically he took studies from both automatic speech recognition and from psycholinguistics, and he looked at the recognition performances of humans and machines on a task that was somewhat related between the two groups. groups. So these, these were not actually um, people and machines tested on the same corpus, but on similar uh, corpora, or similar tasks. And what he showed was that, th so this is 1997, so this is 22 years ago that with connected, connected digits, or by the way, this is a logarithmic scale of the word error rate. So in gray, we have the automatic speech recognition systems, and in blue, we have the humans. So basically what we see here is that on whatever task you, t you take, connected digits, letters, uh, resource management corpus, Wall Street Journal, uh, switchboard convers conversational speech, you always see that the humans are outperforming the machines by about a factor of 10. So this was in 1997. As you all know, the field moved on, and things got a bit better. But basically what he was able to do was actually look at different types of uh, noise. So in 2012, we see that in quiet for, um, uh, this is a 1K to 8K uh, word recognition task, machines are still uh, a factor 10 uh, worse than humans. And when you add background noise, it's quite bad. But l also look at the humans. So, so I start out saying that humans are the ideal listeners, but we also have problems listening. Even if you have really good hearing, there are situations where you are in trouble, and that's spe specifically the case when you are listening at background noise. So then, human parity was uh, came about, which was in 2017, we basically see that the humans and machines recognize speech at the same level. So this was amazing, I thought. I mean, I had not expected to see that happening so fast. So you might think we're there. So humans are no longer the best systems, recognition systems out there. I don't fully agree that with that. There's a more recent study by Spiller et al. from Oldenburg University and they basically looked at a different type of speech again, and they looked at um, uh, matrix sentences in uh, a minus 10 dB background noise, and they looked at how people and machines are able to use spatial cues. And it turns out then that although in the case where there's only one channel, a one channel scene, machines actually outperform the listeners, but when there's a multi-channel scene, machines have a harder time because they're not able to use the spatial cues as well as we can do. So what causes this performance gap? Well, for a very long time, trading material was the designing fa factor. ASR systems were typically trained on hundreds of hours, whereas humans are exposed to hundreds of thousands of hours. And Roger Moore has uh, done two studies Try to calculate uh, the, no the number of hours that people actually have access to when, while they're growing up, and the gap with machines was enormous. But as, uh, but as, we, s as we have seen, the gap has become much, much smaller, and in the case of uh, conversational speech, is basically gone. Nevertheless, there are multiple situations, like the one from Spiller et al., where humans are much, much better than machines. So why is that? Well, one aspect is the flexibility. 
So humans are very good at, at adapting to new speakers, to new speaking styles, to new languages very, very quickly. And machines can do that far less well. Another factor is the available information. So ASR systems typically have language models based on word frequency and word co-occurrence probabilities, whereas humans also have word knowledge or they have priming. So in some studies uh, in the past few years, um, people have been looking at whether lower level uh, cues are also different between humans and machines. So there have been, as far as I know, two corpora developed for specifically for human machine uh, co uh, comparisons. One is uh, developed by Oldenburg, it's called the Oldenburg Logatom speech corpus, which consists of um, uh, syllables without any lexical meaning, so without any word meaning. And there was a concert challenge at uh, Interspeech 2008, organized by Martin Cook and myself, where we uh, looked at the recognition of consonants and compared human and machine uh, performances on these tasks. And what we found was that even when higher level information is removed, humans still outperform machines. So not only at the higher level information, is there is a, there is a gap between uh, humans and machines, but also at the lower level. And um, uh, Meyer and Nicole Meyer, they show that this difference comes from the availability and the use of acoustic cues and features. So when you think of it as a human listener, you have the full acoustic signal available to yourself, whereas when you are a machine, you are stuck with whatever acoustic features are being given uh, to, to you. So I think... There's a lot to be gained from cross and interdisciplinary research. And I would like to now move on after having created hopefully a bit of a common background, a common knowledge between the two fields, uh, to some um, different types of research that have tried to combine knowledge from one field and methodology from one field into the other field. And um, the first one is, of course, that you can use techniques from automatic speech recognition to learn more about how humans perceive speech. So in the past, before people started to cross over and use ASR techniques, um, people typically analyzed small corpora for specific speech features. They had to do it by hand or semi-automatically, but it was a lot of work. Then, um, in recent years, people are using automatic speech recognition to actually for instance, investigate pronunciation variation, which was done by my former uh, PhD student, Barbara, who's one of the co-organizers here. Very happy that she's here. Um, to investigate pronunciation variation of the T production in Dutch in a large corpus. Or you can investigate the representation of second language sounds in, uh, in the first language space, by, uh, such as done by Kazi Lecombeer and colleagues. So you can use ASR techniques to analyze far more data than you could do by hand. Also, ASR techniques have been used to investigate theories or uh, ideas about how human speech processing might actually work. So, for instance, it has been used to find that inf infant directed speech is actually easier to learn than adult directed speech, which might explain why people tend to speak in a different way to young children than uh, to adults. Uh, but also how children learn to segment speech from continuous speak by Oko Rezanen, um, the interaction of first and second language sound systems by Gong et al, and the role of listeners' attention processing in perceived sentence uh, stress by Sofkri um, Kokouros. And in, um, some time ago, I actually used automatic speech recognition to build a computational model of human speech processing, trying to figure out what the role is of durational cues in the disambiguation of speech in human speech processing. You can also go the other way around. So can we use uh, information about how humans perceive speech to improve automatic speech recognition? And the answer is yes. And you typically, I, I bet you've heard of the MFCCs and the PLPs, and these are based on how humans, uh, they're based on human hearing. So information about the important characteristics or the important aspects of the speech signal uh, in, uh, during your, uh, human hearing are being incorporated in these acoustic factors and actually have been shown to improve recognition performance quite dramatically. In the early 2000s, there was a period where people were looking at template-based ASR, uh, in which case you have, rather than building acoustic models for each separate sound, you would have chunks of speech being uh, stored in the inside the, the, um, uh, the computer and any incoming speech was matched against these chunks of speech. And these chunks could have a different lengths. And this 
technique was actually based on the episodic theories of uh, human speech processing, which do exactly the same. In its most extreme form, episodic theories basically say, every input you get, you store all the speech, including all the, gender inf uh, all the speaker information. When there's new speech coming in, you compare that new speech to all the uh, speech that you've ever heard in your life before. People are starting to move away from such a drastic view, but that's basically the episod episodic theory. So they're very closely correlated. And of course, there are the art artificial neural networks, which are based on the neural networks we have in our brains and which have led to the deep neural networks that we see all around us at Interspeech now. So there are different ways that we can combine um, automatic speech recognition and human speech processing and how we can learn from uh, one another. And one that I would like to uh, highlight in the last 10 minutes uh, of my talk is the flexibility. So as I said, is our systems are still not as good as humans in perceiving speech in many uh, um, uh, conditions. And I think flexibility is a very important aspect of that. And when I mean flexibility, you can think about adaptation to new speakers, to channel conditions, to dialect, speaking style, is someone reading or uh, talking to a friend or giving a lecture, new languages. We do it all the time. And I specifically want to focus on speech perception, on, sorry, on, on perceptual learning. So there's a lot of evidence out there that humans show a temporary shift of the phonetic categories when they're listening to a new speaker. And they can actually permanently shift their uh, phonetic categories as well, for instance, when you're learning a new language. And they have the ability to decide whether to merge phonetic categories or to create new ones, depending on the language they want to learn. So machines are also able to, able to adapt to new speakers and new languages using short-term adaptation other algorithms and longer-term adaptation other techniques. But when you want to learn a new language, when you want to map your ASR system to another language, human interference is needed to create the new acoustic models for these new sounds. Now, my dream is that we do not need that anymore. So my ultimate goal is to try and build ASR system that can flexibly adapt to a new language and decide for itself whether it needs to create a new acoustic category or not. So to investigate this, to get to my goal, the first experiments that I'm, I'm looking at have to do with perceptual learning. And this is a, um, um, something that has been shown for human speech uh, processing. And perceptual learning is defined as relatively long-lasting changes to an organism's perceptual system that improve its ability to respond to its environment and are caused by this environment. So basically it says you're changing something in your perceptual system, for instance, your phonetic categories, because you were exposed to something in your environment that caused that, um, that change. And the specific one that um, me and my colleagues have been investigating for the past few years is called lexically guided perceptual learning, which was originally defined or uh, invented by uh, Norris et al. in 2003. And basically this paradigm, what it does is it tries to understand how people adapt to ambiguous speech or to um, uh, idiosyncratic speech or to a dialect. So you have an ambiguous input in this case, something between F and S, and then you have one group of people who hear that particular acoustic sound embedded in a word where it can only mean an F, it's like chef. Another group of people will hear the exact same acoustic token embedded in a word where it has to be interpreted as an S, like mouse. So you have two groups of people that are both getting the exact same acoustic token, but one is basically being told it's an F and the other group is being told it's an S. Then what will happen is that when you s ask them to listen to something like leaf lease and you replace that final sound with something ambiguous, then it can be leaf, it can be lease. And what you see is that the people who have been exposed to this particular context where the ambiguous sound was to supposed to be an F, hear this minimal pair as leaf, whereas these people hear it as lease. So it's the exact same acoustic token, 
but based on the environment in which you hear it, you're adapting your phoneme categories such that you're suddenly hearing the exact same ambiguous word in two different ways depending on what you've been exposed to. So this phenomenon has been shown in many different experiments. And basically, it causes a temporary change in phonetic category boundaries. It needs lexical or phonotactic knowledge. So it, you, it needs to be embedded in a word. It generalizes to words that have not been presented earlier. It's speaker dependent. So when I have a weird pronunciation and you adapt your phonetic categories for me, then it won't do the same thing automatically immediately for someone else. It will ha you have, will have to do that again for that particular person as well. And it's really fast. So we've shown that people only need 10 to 15 of these ambiguous tokens to already ap adapt their uh, phonetic categories. And it's long-lasting. We don't know how long-lasting it is. Uh, that's why we typically, when we have people in the lab doing these, these kind of experiments, we tell them not to come back for a year and a half. Um, because we don't know how long these adaptations actually last. So I'll be talking um, about these two aspects of lexi-guided perceptual learning. So the temporary change and the fastness of it. And what we did was we were in interested in figuring out whether DNNs can do the same thing. Because well, deep neural nets are inspired by the human brains, but can they also flexibly adapt to new types of speech like human listeners can? So that was the question that we had, and there was a, this was a paper in last year's InterSpeech. So we trained a baseline deep neural net, a simple feedforward network on Dutch red speech, and then we took the acoustic tokens from one of our human experiments to retrain the baseline model. And basically, we, we trained three different models, an ambiguous L model, which contained a version where an, an, the L was replaced by an ambiguous sound between L and R, an ambiguous R model, where we retrained the model with uh, 40 items where the final R was replaced by the ambiguous LR, and we had a baseline model to compare our models with to make sure that any difference that we saw were not due to the fact there was new training material coming in. Coming in. So basically, the ambiguous L and ambiguous R models are the most important ones. Those are the two listener groups that we're trying to replicate here. And then we visualized the intermediate representations in the hidden layers to see whether there was any, cor error, any correlation with human uh, perceptual adaptation. And at the same time, we were trying to open up the black box that's called the DNN. So our findings with the humans was that we have more R responses when exposed to a context that is more R-like, in this case, Wecker, which is alarm clock. And the, the, on the opposite side, more L responses when exposed to words like apple, where the final L, L is replaced by the ambiguous sound. So we were expecting to see differences particularly between our big, ambiguous L and ambiguous R model. So we plotted the, um, the, the, um, uh, the speech representation in the hidden layers, in this particular case, the fourth hidden layer, using PCA visu visualizations. And what we see here is, this is the ambiguous sound. And this is our R sound, and this is our L sound. And the ambiguous sound is nicely situated between the two speech representations in our baseline model. Now, when we train the model and say the ambiguous sound is supposed to be an R, we see that the ambiguous sound is moving towards the R category, but not in mixing with it. It's just moving towards it. And the L category is separate. When we do it for the L, we now have our L category here. We see that the, uh, uh, the ambiguous sound is moving towards the L category, and the R category is separate. So we're seeing a shift of the phonetic space which is very similar to what we, have, we, what we saw with the humans. Now, we then went on to, s to investigate how fast, so how, how much ma training material machines need uh, compared to humans. Humans only need 10 to 15 ambiguous items. How about the deep neural nets? We did the exact same experiment again, but rather than training the system with the 40 items, we retrained them with four items in 10 bins. And we tested on unseen data. So we have a training bin with four items and tested on bin two. Then we added the two and we tra uh, trained on bin one and two and tested on three. And we went on like that until we were training on nine bins and testing on the last one. Then what we see, we have to focus on this orange line here at the top, 
This one says that the ambiguous R, uh, that the ambiguous sound is mapped onto an R. This is an, the R model. The most important thing that you should be focusing on is the fact that this adaptation is really, really fast. Already in the first bin, we see a jump from 50% or 50, uh, yeah, 50 percent up to 85 percent of the ambiguous sound being classified as an R. So like for the humans, it's going really fast, this adaptation. And we see the same fast adaptation in the, adap in the ambiguous L model, going starting from zero, going up to 50%. So deep neural nets trained with ambiguous sounds show perceptual learning, not only at the decision layer, but actually also in the intermediate layers. They only need a few ambiguous items, and they show a similar step-like function as humans. So interestingly, the visualizations, they show the phoneme category boundaries are not simply re with, uh, redrawn to include the new ambiguous sound into the existing category, but rather we see a shift. So we, we see a warping of the uh, phoneme category space. This is not what is currently assumed to be the case for human speech processing. So it might be that the human perceptual learning also involves a similar nonlinear distortion of the, of the perceptual space, rather than this redrawing that people have been thinking about so far. So I'm currently setting up experiments where I'm going to test that particular hypothesis in human listeners. So we're going back to how human speech processing is investigated in automatic speech recognition, which is, gives us hypotheses about what might be happening in human speech processing. So we're basically closing the loop here. So my take home message, collaborating with people from other speech disciplines will make you look at a problem from different viewpoints, leads to more knowledge about how humans process speech, leads to interesting new acoustic features, architectures and approaches to ASR, and is fun. I didn't talk about that, but I can, sh I can assure you it's really, really good fun. And I hope that with this talk, I've given you some common ground from both fields that will allow you to basically enjoy interspeech even more than you're already doing by talking to people from different disciplines. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we have time, about a minute or so, so we can take a question. Michael is coming. <laughs> uh, thank you for this uh, fascinating talk. Uh, I gave a talk a couple of years ago at TSD in uh, Prague uh, from a similar viewpoint, though my own viewpoint, uh, my own background is much more in speech recognition and uh, frankly hearing perception. And w one of the things, you know, I came to the same conclusion that humans, I'm pretty sure, are much better than uh, machines at things like domain adaptation, accent adaptation, uh, learning new languages. But uh, I was actually unable to find a lot of hard direct evidence in terms of uh, doing things like taking some of the common test materials we have and actually uh, getting, m actually formally measuring human performance on some of the standard test tasks we work on today or test tasks that emphasize, let's say, the ability to rapidly adapt to new, to, yep. to new conditions. I'm just wondering if coming from a very hardcore human speech perception perspective, if you see value in running such experiments to sort of inform the community more about what machines are very good at doing versus what humans still do much better than machines? Um, I would say that within psycholinguistics, that's not a key thing to investigate. It's more about developing the theories rather than understanding performance. Having said that, now, so I, I have done a lot of experiments on how non-native listeners perceive speech in background noise. I have lots of numbers for these, so I, I actually have run recognition experiments on humans on a particular t task. So in those cases, yes, you have them, but then we don't have the uh, machine data. 
Um, so that's why in 2008 we had the constant challenge. That's why the Olo Corpus was uh, created to get to these numbers because we sort of we have this. We know that we humans are better than machines, but we can't really quantify it. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to do more of this kind of research, but it's 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 time consuming. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I agree, that would be wonderful to have more of these studies that actually quantify the difference between humans and machines. And that's why I was really happy with the paper I showed you, the Spiller one. Uh, that's, a, that's a recent one that's actually moving into a new domain, trying to figure out what the differences are between humans and machines in that particular domain. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we're out of time, so uh, for other questions, I'm sure that Odette will be <laughs> answering them later on.